Uh, so uh, the, the talk of today is about uh, uh, Jupyter Hub uh, or Python in the browser. So the whole thing is about doing Python interactively on Synet, but in your browser. And uh, it doesn't have to be Python. It can be R as well. And uh, now Python or interactive Python, it's a little bit funny to put the two together because Python has always been interactive. After all, there's a prompt. And you type something and you get something back. How is that not interactive? Uh, so it is interactive. And even not long after Python was born, um, there's been an IPython, which actually stood for interactive Python, uh, which improved some of the interactiveness, uh, especially when it comes to graphics and uh, came preloaded with a couple of modules that are convenient. And so that made it even more interactive, but it was still prompt based. You just got a prompt, you type something in, type something out. Uh, and some people, but it's still this prompt based approach where you type something, you get something back. Okay. Um, oh, mm, what is nice about a notebook instead of just a prompt is that rather than having just a prompt and, and you can't go back with, with the notebook, you can basically go back to the previous prompt and re-execute it. Um, and it kind of mimics the way that environments like Mathematica or Maple or MATLAB work. Um, and, and it can be very useful to, to explore things. We'll, we'll see that too. Uh, so you can, so IPython notebook had been uh, this interface that sort of built into IPython for a while. Um, and you basically, can do anything you could do in IPython, but now in the browser. So rather than having the prompt, it sort of sends it in the browser and then sends it back to IPython and does the work. Um, now, this idea of having such a notebook where instead of having just a prompt, you just have uh, a notebook isn't really dependent on the fact that you're using Python. You could do this with R, you could do this in Bash, you could do this in Perl. And so they, they decided essentially to spin off the fact that it's a notebook from the actual language you're using. And so Jupyter is, is essentially the notebook part of IPython. And uh, once it was spun off, it was possible to sort of hook it into other languages, such as R, um, but apparently also Julia, Haskell, and Ruby. In fact, Jupyter is a, a, a portmanteau of Julia, Python, and R. So that's the Ju, Python, R. Oh, so that's where it comes from. Yes. Oh. Um, now, that's nice. You could you could run this Jupyter with IPython uh, fairly easily locally, uh, but then there's this extra layer called the Jupyter Hub uh, that's especially useful for multi-user environments, uh, such as those at Synet. Uh, so if it's your own machine, uh, your your IPython is running in the background, your your web browser is running in the same machine, uh, so of course they can connect to each other. But with, what if you wanted your IPython to run on Synet? but your stuff still to pop up in your browser uh, on your machine. And that's what uh, Jupyter Hub can do. And even better, it can do it with, with uh, several users at the same time. Uh, so the IPythons are supposed to run as whatever user it is, uh, but then um, your browser connects to a server uh, that's just sort of a general server for uh, all the Jupyter stuff, all the, the notebook stuff. So that's something we've set up on Synet as a sort of a trial. Um, it's a trial. We've used some machines that uh, that we got from somewhere else that were used for something else before, um, and so uh, there's no guarantee that any of it will ever work. Uh, but it has so far. So <laughs> um, they're 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 decent machines. So there's we've we've got two uh, two nodes, two servers. They have 128 gigs of memory, so you can do some some memory in intensive stuff. They have 16 cores, so uh, and the load sort of gets gets distributed distributed over the two. So there's some uh, some reasonable amount of resources there. Um, and uh, the way you access it, uh, as almost always with anything in Synet, is you always have to go through our login nodes first. So uh, but once you're, so, so there's no connect uh, uh, web address that you can go to to get to, to these Jupyter servers. And it's kind of a security. We do this for all of our stuff that you can get to the GPC. You can't get to the TCS, you can't get to the Blue Gene, you can't go anywhere except through those login nodes. And the idea is anything that sort of mounts uh, everybody's files, we want to protect as much as possible. So that's sort of a 
the security. Uh, and uh, so that means that to get to the Jupyter Hub node, you have to do what's called an SSH tunnel. Um, it's not very hard to do, but you have to open a terminal, you have to SSH with your username to log in or sign it, and then there's these extra flags you can give to SSH to open this tunnel. Essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna take a certain port on your machine, in this case uh, 8888, and what's called forward it to port 8000 on uh, one of the Jupyter Hub servers. The dash N and dash F are optional, um, but they cause you to actually not log in and get a prompt on Signet, but it just hang, just runs in the background, and the only purpose of this command is to open the uh, open port. Actually, I forgot. I think N is not do don't do anything, and F is running in the background. So, uh, so we have an alias for the the hub, or so so Jupyter Hub is an alias that only works on uh, on the login nodes, and it actually sort of sends it to either. Uh, the first Jupyter Hub server or the second one. So you, don't, you can't quite be sure which one you're, you're getting. If you want to be sure, there's ways to do that, but um, now you have to know the explicit node name. Uh, so, if, so essentially, you'll select one of the two, uh, the two hubs. Now, once you've set up this, this tunnel, on your local machine, 888 is, is a port where you can access uh, the, the Jupyter Hub. And so you just type into the URL box in your browser, localhost colon 8888, and then you can log in with your sign editor. Um, and then once you've done that, you should see your files in your home directory. And if you don't, it can be because it's a bit busy, just reload and you'll see the files. That's part of the experimental part of the <laughs> um, if you have time now. Now, uh, the way uh, we've set it up is you can already create Python 2, 3, and uh, R notebooks, so the, uh, some different flavors of, of, uh, of scripting in it. Um, I haven't actually seen anybody use Julia, but if you want it, we can look into getting that and make it a proper Jupyter. <coughs> so, uh, sorry, yeah, no, sorry. Uh, so Jupyter, you don't have to run Jupyter uh, in, as, as a Jupyter Hub through Signet. You can run it yourself too. You can run it on your own machine as well. Um, and if you've installed uh, an Anaconda Python, for instance, you, you, you already have it. Uh, so all you have to do is basically start it with saying Jupyter Notebook, if you wanted to do it locally. So you, could, you don't always have to do it uh, this way. But of course, what's nice about doing it in Signet is that you, you've got all your Signet files. So if you have some post processing to do uh, with files on Signet, this could be useful. Uh, right. So it's a notebook interface. You can mix uh, text and graphics, and I've got a few screenshots. Um, so when you just open it, it kind of looks like this. I uh, simplified it a little bit so that it's clear, but um, you see your files. This is after you've logged in. You see your files. Uh, you could, there's a tab that shows what notebooks are curr currently running, um, clusters is if you're doing uh, IPython clusters. But, um, and then you can create new notebooks by clicking on this new button and then there's different things you can do. You can create a text file so you could actually use this as a, as a remote editor for, for Signet as well if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend it but you can. Uh, you can create a folder. You can open a terminal which is kind of funny too so you can have a terminal in your uh, in your browser. But all of that isn't the point. I don't know why those are the first options and, and the <laughs> last ones are not. The point is to run Python notebooks and uh, this is this was a snapshot from a local installation where I only had Python three installed, or maybe yeah, I think so. So I just had the, the default Python, but you will see, uh, and we'll do it in the demonstration later. Uh, Python two, Python three, and R here. So you select one of those, like for instance this one, um, then you get this interface. So you get basically an inbox where you can type your first command, and it will give you the output. You can type another command. You can go back to previous boxes. To re, re execute these. Just print hello world, I guess it's Python 2, um, and it prints hello world. It automatically saves stuff. If you want to change the name of your notebook, you uh, just click here and you change the name from untitled to something else. Um, <coughs> there's a bunch of, of uh, things you can do copy, paste. Um, so if you're going to just if you've got, who here has played with the, with the notebook before? 
expect the value to get to that happy scenario. Um, <clears throat> so, because people are just started, and I have to explain that to get anything started, you type a command and press enter, nothing happens. You have to do ship that. It doesn't work. Yes, it works. Um, even though it's auto saved, I would also recommend uh, save it. Press the save button anyway. Um, you know, just don't want to lose anything. And and one of the things that is kind of different, although you can set it up um, if you, if it's on your own control, uh, from an iPad phone. Every iPad phone, you often uh, combine it with PyLab, and you get NumPy and SciPy and a whole bunch of uh, Matplotlib uh, preloaded. Um, these notebooks don't have those preloaded, but you can get a very similar sort of uh, environment by just basically importing everything with PyLab and making sure that the matplotlib <coughs> uh, works as, uh, as intended for a notebook. Um, if you don't, you still get inline graphics. So, so when you when you say plot, you get a plot right there. Uh, but uh, you can really manipulate it and with the notebook. You can manipulate it a bit more. Now, um, the notebooks are very nice, but there's a few things that I want you to know that are not really uh, suitable for this. First of all, they're not they're not scripts. They're, they're their own format. Uh, all these boxes are defined. In fact, if you save it, I think it becomes a, so, some sort of a, a JavaScript object or JSON file. Uh, and because of that, it doesn't always work very well with, with version control. So um, if you've got sort of scripts you run a lot or that, that are used in a production setting, you probably don't want to do this. You want to be able to just run them. You want to change a little bit. You want to keep track of those. You, you, uh, and the reason that that doesn't work is that every box is basically a line in this file. And so if you change anything in a 10-line box, you don't know where the, the change went. It's very hard to do version control on that. Um, it's designed to run in the browser. There's ways to convert it and then make it into a script, but that's some work. So now you're tied into using a browser might not always be what you want. And, and the graphics is inline. So it means if you, if you plot something, you get a little picture. And then if you plot something again, again, you get a new picture. And this is different from IPython, where if you plot two things, they now overlap in the same picture. So I can plot one curve and another curve. They come together in one, in one graph. The default for, uh, for the, uh, the notebook is to produce two graphs with the loop. So if you're doing very... Uh, if you're producing sort of a quality plot for a publication where you want to tweak things a little bit, um, this is not the best uh, environment because it, it, you get new plots all the time. Now, there's ways to make it use the old plot, but now you've got your plot commands here and uh, your plot has scrolled up to, uh, to the top. Uh, so it's still not great. It's better to do something like IPython with a, an X server have a separate window for your for your graph and, and your command somewhere else. So that that's <coughs> one one use case where the notebook environment isn't great. But if you quickly want to plot something, of course, it, it, that's fine. Now you can jump around in a notebook, uh, which can be good and bad. I put it here in the drawbacks because it also means that um, although these are numbers, you're not quite sure what you did. Like you changed something in the top. You, you know, the variable A was set to 10, and you changed it to 20 and executed that, and you, you scrolled back down. You can do all of that, uh, but so the order of execution is no longer um, easily understood from, from the notebook. So it's, so it's now <laughs> that's all true, but there are also advantages. So one of the advantages is that you can jump around in the notebook, <laughs> and you can go whatever you want to do. Uh, go back to different parts. Just re just only do that uh, that uh, part. And what what I find uh, so that's so it's both a good and a bad. You just have to use it uh, in the right context. There's auto save, but, so that's great. Um, you can rerun parts of your code. And this is really nice if you're exploring data and you've got a fairly sizable data set, and you just load it in mem in, in, in into the notebook, so it's in memory now. And you want to do things with it, and you want to try it again. If this was a script and you had to run the script again, that script would have to reload all of that data. So, so for exploring data, this can be very useful to just have it there and and, and work with it. Uh, and you can also add sort of text portions. That's not a really nice thing about a notebook. So you can basically make them look like an article. You just explain. You've got headers. You explain what you're doing. 
um, and then you have the, the code right, right in there, uh, which makes it also quite nice for things like demos or sharing or, or teaching. Uh, it just, the, that format just gets everything together, rather than just putting everything in comments, which is good if you're doing scripts, um, but you can't really format those comments in any sort of way. Um, this, this can be quite nice. Another sort of advantage is that once you sort of have something that works, you could export the whole thing as a script. And then you probably want to edit that script a little bit, make sure that it indeed runs linearly as intended. Uh, but you, so you, you could start in the, in, in the notebook, export it as a, as a script, and, and just continue with there to make it into sort of something that runs in production. Yes? What does it do with the text? The uh, basically, they, they become comments, I think. They just all mm -hmm. become comments. Yeah. 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 Can you write formulas? Or? You can do LaTeX, yeah. LaTeX, yeah. 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 So that's very similar to Sage. Do you, are you yes, familiar with Sage? Yes, very similar to Sage. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was wondering, how old is Jupiter and how widely accepted is it? Sorry? How old is Jupiter? How old? And how widely accepted is it? Uh, well, the, the, the IPython notebook has been around for a long time, so it's, it's, it's widely accepted. People put their notebooks online and you can mm -hmm. sort of view them. Uh, so it's. Well, Jupyter sort of come out in the last what, two years or so. It's yeah, so, so Jupyter is really the evolution of IPython Notebook. Uh, so Jupyter has been around since 2015, I think, as its own project. Uh, mm -hmm. But the the idea of the notebook has been around for a while. Um, if you're publishing scripts and stuff, or you're sharing it, I would probably still convert them to pure Python, uh, because you don't want your coworkers to have to start it in the because mm -hmm. the, the Within the notebook, not only can you export to a script, you can also import a script. So you can run a script from it. So if if somebody wants to run in a notebook and you send them a plain Python script, they can still run it in that environment. In fact, it's quite nice you, once you've run it, all those variables that you define in that script are still accessible. So now they can play with all that data. So would you run a script it, it, it lives in that session? Yes, so that's right. It, right. it doesn't it, close, it doesn't run it as a standard. It, exactly, it keeps it exactly. uh, yeah. active. So it's so it's a really nice environment, but if you're really sort of documenting or, or making a final version of, of some a piece of code, I'd probably still do a, a Python. Wait, is Jupyter reliable? Like, uh, Sorry, is Jupyter reliable? Oh yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It it hooks into Python on the back end, so whatever you can do in Python, is, is uh, Jupyter will do. Um, and the nice thing about it being. Uh, we, the, you can run it locally too. But so, so if you did anything on Cyanide and for some reason these servers uh, do break, because I said it's, 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 the experimental setup is only on our side, our hardware and the way we've implemented. But as long as you save your, your notebooks, if for some reason something is wonky at the Cyanide setup, you just you, you down, you download it to your own machine and you just run it there. And they will work. Um, I think I mentioned it also, but it's kind of funny that it has a terminal as well, so you can actually uh, you could use this to log into a sign editor. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then finally, the, the hub is nice because it, it allows different users to run. To run. Um, I'll show at the end um, how you would run this yourself if you didn't use the hub. So as, just as you can run it on your own machine, you can run a Jupyter Hub instance yourself on your assign sign that account uh, mm -hmm. with, without having to go uh, through these, these servers, which I guess could be useful if you wanted, uh, for instance, to use one of the 256 gig uh, nodes because you really have that large memory, but it is a notebook. Uh, you could do that, uh, but it's a lot more work. And so uh, another advantage of, of the, the set of the sign is it has all your files, if you have the data at sign it, you can, you can run it here. Um, you don't need to set up an X server. You don't need to set up VLC because it all gets embedded in the in the browser. As I said, there's downsides to that, but but you know, it's certainly nice um, when it works. Uh, the servers have a fair bit of memory, so 128 gigabytes. Uh, it's shared by all users, but these things aren't very, very <coughs> widely used yet. I think we have two users right now, so um, there is uh, opportunity. And you don't have to set up your own Jupyter Hub on Cyanide. Right. 
um, setting up different, what, so these are called kernels within the Jupyter notebook setting. So you have, uh, you have the notebook and they can have different languages. And so the languages are called kernels because they basically hook in to, to, and so we have three installed for Python 2, Python 3, and R. Um, we could install more, uh, but that's, that seems like a good, a good start. And they all work the same, the same way. So it's really the syntax of the commands that is different. You can mix them, though. I don't think you can. Uh, but. What about your own packages? Like, because the fact, oh, I guess we're getting to that. But. So, so uh, yeah. So it's, it is possible to, <laughs> so the, way, the way you, so what I've tried to do is make sure that most of the common packages are just mm -hmm. installed. And I took the latest version of Anaconda. And so mm -hmm. since it's, it's meant for exploration, if you need that very latest package, mm -hmm. then maybe you'd have to do it differently, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you can clone the whole environment. I don't think cloning okay. is the word, but basically make it a new virtual environment that's mm -hmm. based off of uh, the existing one. And then you can install packages in that. So you cannot install packages through this because it's a system-wide yeah. one. But then if you clone it into a virtual environment, um, then you can. So I'll, I'll, I can show in a demo how that works. So if you load uh, Jupyter with the Conda environment, like load it, it'll just import that. It knows which one to use, or? Yeah, so it's a, um, sorry, that's that again. Like if you, yeah. you, like normally you just source a Conda environment, right, but then that's I open right. iPython and it knows yeah. where yeah. everything is. So right, so, the this, same thing with this? so this is similar. You can, so whenever you install your own, uh, let me go for that, like this. So when you, if you clone your environment into a new virtual environment, it will be listed under the new box. Oh, it'll just. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. And then once you've selected that, it, see there's this conda tab. Mm -hmm. That's where you could add packages. So there's actually okay. a, a, you don't even have to do conda install. You just select which ones you want. You say I want to install. But that only works for the for environments that you make because mm -hmm. you don't have to buy permission to these environments. Sure. Right. So let's try it out. Just a quick question about uh, sure. you said it runs with your credentials. Yes. So then can they override files or anything in the, in the tree or each of their each are all sorry. Okay. Yeah. No, no, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that would be he's got a word. Yeah. yeah, no, that's word that's wording. No, no, no. You, you log in, you see your files, nobody else sees your files. Right. That, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, I see that now, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let's see. So so we'll have to do this tunneling first. Um, and we've got Windows 10 on here, which allows you to have a bash shell. So I'm going to just use that. But whatever shell you have doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're on Linux, you have It feels as if it's already in use. Let me try it anyway. Try it. <laughs> anyway, you got what you need to do. Hey, so once you've got your tunnel set up, um, you're asked to log in again. And this is a good thing because uh, with that port open, especially if this is, say, a lab computer, anybody that now accesses that port would be able to see your file if we didn't also password protect it on the other side. Mm -hmm. So you, you use your password to set up the tunnel. And then use a password again to log into the other side, essentially, and that's how it's it's secure. It goes through SSH, so it's encrypted, so that's also secure. Uh, I don't really have to save this. It's not showing my file, so I'm reloading it. There we go. So I see my file, um, and I can start. I can start a new uh, Python environment. So I've got currently two Python 2s. These are Python 3s. Um, it doesn't say 3, but that's what it is. And an R. So, so these are each virtual environments? These are yeah, virtual environments. Virtual. If I went into the Conda tab, so here's Python 3 essentially, and here's Python 
two, and then you can add a new environment, you give it a name, and what is the value from. And once you've done that, then you can let's not do that right now. Um, but so the root one is, is Python 3. The scripter actually runs on Python 3, uh, which is why it doesn't, men doesn't mention that it is Python 3. <laughs> uh, just confusing, I guess. And then there's a list of available packages. You can select them and, uh, and it's feather in them, there. but only in your own environment. Mm. It's, fe it's feather in there. Sorry? Feather. Feather? Available package. See, there's a search there. Yeah. The way I think it gets better. Wait a second. <clears throat> Why is it only like 600 available packages? Like where where is it getting that? Is, is it only the pack packages that are already inside it? Like Coma it? has its own. So whatever yeah. you can install with Coma install should be in that list. Okay. Um, once it's your own environment, uh, it's going to be in your home directory. You could you could mm -hmm. uh, do it on you the command line as well. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, build it up to whatever yeah. Python. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, although I've had some difficulties getting it to work with Python two because Python three is native, but if you do Python three, it's like mm -hmm. I know it works. Well, Python two it should, but as I said, it's it's not its native environment. Um, so that's how you would do your own, but. Uh, there's quite a, so there's 332 packages installed already. Of course, things like NumPy and, and PyPy and MyPublic are uh, on the list. So uh, the only thing I'd be careful with, so, so the way it works here is good. You start in your home directory. Um, you see all your files. Uh, if you don't have a link to your scratch directory and there's files there, I don't think there's any way to get there now because it doesn't go up from where you started when you started in your home directory. Um, so I have a little. Put a soft link to yeah, the soft link somewhere. I think it's start a Python three notebook. You can't just write an absolute path into it. No, that's a problem on the the server side. Yeah, right? yeah. this might be particular to me because I I own those files and I might have. Maybe they don't. Maybe you can open one that already exists. like this. But if I want to, uh, so nothing is, is supported by default. So I think it's supported. This is somehow it just became a text box that doesn't have an in in it. So you can change the cell type. It just shows me that. That's not good. So we want Matplot lib to go in line. Your notebook. Okay, now I can go back. So the notebook environment of this is 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 
nice. Um, you can save this figure. Um, you can zoom in. You can zoom into a rectangle so you can see it. If you're done with the figure, you can you can sort of save it or stop the interaction. And then you're done. Um, it's just, now it's just pictures. Yeah. The two things. Is it yeah. easy to merge lines after you've written them? Yeah. I think you have like a single box. You just select them and then control. I selected them and then. I guess it's just a cell merge or edit merge. Somewhere here is it? Merge, merge cell. cell. Okay. So, so you could now. you could write a big chunk of code and then say this thing works, I'll just make it one cell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to reinitialize your environment, I guess that play button will just run it step by step at the top or Yeah, and that, and in the kernel there's there's you can restart, you can clear the output, you can run restart and run all. Uh, if I wanted to start from the very Top to the last few, I'm sure, and then I will just start from the top. The main reason I don't use these is because I always confuse myself with like line 49 being here. And then it is. It, it gets there. confusing after a while. You want to start again. Yeah. 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 So yeah. It, I guess is it easy to also like drag and drop lines around yeah. if you like because you have map yeah. and the lib in notebook in the wrong, wrong spot. Well, you, you, you can certainly yeah, cut you and paste. You can use the arrows to move the move the lines up and down. Oh, you can. Okay. Oh, in the top there. Yeah. yeah. yeah I see. You can like select line five and move it, or yeah. Because you want that Put to be the at the top, the map plot lib notebook thing. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that those are those are yeah. The top of the yeah. toolbar. Yeah. 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 It allows you to change the. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's all you want to do. So then you can sort of keep yourself organized. Yeah. Set those you just have to Other coding is important, so I can go there. The blue and green mean something different. Yeah, so this blue is, well, blue is in and, and red is out here. Oh, th these guys. Yeah, you can change the text between the two. You think so? They just have to, yeah, they have to have been, 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 been run or something. Yeah. 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 I think it's been yeah. pre yeah. But if you restart it, it's probably going to go back to. Right there. That's a good question, actually. Will it render to PDF? Sorry? Does it render to PDF once you create yeah, the document? I think there is that. one, yeah. You can you export print it, but there's a, there's a bunch of... Download as? Yeah, download as. So you can do yeah. a notebook, Python script, markdown, PDF, uh, HTML. I'm not sure what this one is. Yeah. So if you wanted to make this into a script, uh, you'd probably first download it as a PI, and mm -hmm. then it does. Yeah, it does. Mm, keep it. What else is it? Yeah, that's weird. Is that, oh. Honestly, it failed. You didn't even it was name previous. It. The same, the same read-only database. Mm. It was giving me the one that he started. It. Unlike in my database, <laughs> <laughs> it keeps a database of the of the notebooks um, because potentially you could connect from different uh, places to the same notebook, and I guess it uses that. But I'm not sure why that is uh, misbehaving right now. All right, it should be behaving a bit better. I'm gonna have to see. Let me know if you guys see this read-only stuff too, if you try it out. 
and I haven't seen that before. Uh, that's new. Live demos are always fun. <laughs> but yeah, so that's that's the the essence of of it. Um, if you wanted to do it yourself and just kind of to show you uh, the trouble that you don't have to go through, um, if you wanted to do this on a compute node, um, first of all, you have to deal with the fact that your home is read-only. And this might be what I'm seeing here, although it's not exactly the same because I am not on a compute node. Uh, you might have to link some of your, your uh, directories that Jupyter uses to something that lives on Scratch. So details aren't very important, but um, if you want Jupyter to be able to write to this, then you have to set it up. And then, of course, you need a node to run on, so you could run in, it interactively, uh, for instance. And then you'd have to load some modules for this to, uh, to get to the hub. And then you want to change to Scratch, because as I said, otherwise you won't see your file, you'll see your home file. But you can't do anything, anything on home from the compute node. And then you would have to uh, basically launch your own notebook with the command Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you don't want a browser here. And you'd have to specify that you basically are willing to accept uh, incoming traffic from any IP address. There's probably a way to figure out what the IP address is, but I don't know if it's your computer, the login node, or, or some, some netted data move. I don't know. So uh, I haven't tried to figure that out. Uh, there's probably a way, but it's tough. Then you still have to set up a tunnel, but now to the host name that is the host name of your compute node, so you, you have to figure out which one that is. Um, set up this tunnel, which is usually very easy. Um, and then you're set. Now you can point your browser to the local host. Uh, here I chose 8889 for. So I'm confused. You still have to. So you have to log in. Right, but the, you have to tunnel from the compute node back to the no, login. No, the tunnel node. is in your own machine. Yes, to what the. So you tunneled from your own machine to login yes. to the host name that you got from whatever your node was. So you have to figure out what node you got. This is going to be GPC-F105N024 or something like that. Yeah. Um, dash IB0 probably. So that's uh, so it's it's yeah. it's quite a bit to do just to start. Um, after that, you're in the same kind of environment except mm -hmm. home is not. Writable, so yeah. make sure you run on Scratch. And you're going to get kicked off for two hours. And then in this case, you're going to get kicked off after two hours. So you'd really only do that if you need it. If, if you either really needed to know that you had the full resources, but by that point, you're probably just going to write a script and submit mm -hmm. it that way. So I don't think, I don't advertise doing this, but this is basically uh, the trouble I've saved you by setting this up um, once I can figure out what the read only database is. Is, is there a way to have this Jupyter Hub talking to all of your compute nodes so that like, you just log into that thing, but in, then it's executing your code somewhere else? Um, in principle, yes. In practice, it, it's tough. Basically, you'd have to define a cluster. Uh, so there is there's a way to, to use clusters in this environment. There's actually a tab for it. Uh, Go back to that. I was thinking clusters. if you have lots of people using it at the same time, I'm guessing that one Jupyter node you're using will get sort of jammed up or? It, it, potentially, yes. Yeah. Um, it's part of the experimental environment. So if it's yeah. something we're finding is getting a lot of usage, we would spin up more instances for that. But you, you said you're, you're kind of asking for the dynamic allocation. That, that's tougher. The, yeah, so, so you wouldn't even bother trying to do a dynamic. You probably just have more nodes and then round robin people between yeah. those. Yeah. Okay. The it's it's not. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. just, just the um, compute panda is setting up uh, a cloud environment where they're doing some of this. I think I don't mm -hmm. know how much it's working yet. But in uh, yeah. in Kalkul, Quebec, they have it on one of their systems. They have this set up in a way where you can do this, or you can request. Uh, a node, and then it puts the node in the queue, and then when your job is ready, it'll open a, basically a Jupyter Hub on that node. Okay. So that's mm -hmm. which is nice. So, it, so it's it's something we can do if there's demand. 
sure. uh, we'll just have to ask them how they did it. Uh, but they, they basically hook in and somewhere there's a button that says, uh, oh, uh, get me an actual no for myself. Uh, the reason that we set this up initially, actually, is somebody was asking for this specifically with large memory in mind. Mm -hmm. And so if it's just any old node, you'll just have to get 16 gigabytes and, and that's it. Um, so the nice thing about these nodes is at least you have quite a bit of memory available. So one question, so if you disconnect your browser and then come back to it the next day, It'll, it should still be running. Okay. Yeah, or in the same state that you found it. Right. So, so I've got my running, so this running tab should then show that these are, mm -hmm. these are running. If you don't want them to be running, you can explicitly shut them down. Um, so apparently I have an R, but this is probably one of the ones that failed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My, that's my issue there. But, but in principle, that's a, and even the terminals are still open. Um, so unless we shut down the server, those keep going. And I don't even think we have a timeout on them. I think we should have a, a safe timeout of you know, a day or so. Right. And the tunnel is running currently in the bash shell on this local machine. That's right. That's right. So, so when you, you close your tunnel, you can't access it, but it still be running. So these, so these things, yeah. so these aren't the server side bits. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. On the server, they keep they keep running. So be nice if you're gonna, you know, load something in memory that is, you know, 100 gigabytes, and then you leave it there. It's you know, not being very. Nice. <laughs> but uh, yeah. we will. Yeah, we do, will know. Do we have swap on these? We don't have swap. On I don't think those. we have swap. We should have swap, but yeah. I don't think these were right for set up as swap. Because uh, with swap, that would be no issue. You just have it running, and it will eventually. Swap it to yeah. disk, and if you don't come back to it, who cares? So, ideally, these would have swapped, but currently, I don't think they, I don't think they have.